Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dina Jackson. I am Western Shoshone from the Tamoke Band in Nevada. I'm with the National American Indian Court Judges Association as a program director, and I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on trauma-informed court systems. Um, this is one of the most popular webinars we've had so far in our series, and I think the topic is just so important for so many um, folks who are involved in working with tribes and um, really even in state courts where Native American people um, are coming into the system. Um, so I'd like to get started um, by introducing our speaker, Victoria Sweet, who is um, an Anishinaabe. She's a pro senior program attorney for the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. She is licensed in Minnesota. Um, Victoria received her JD from Mich Michigan State University College of Law with a certificate in Indigenous Law and Policy. She attended the Pre-Law Summer Institute at the American Indian Law Center and earned her MA, ED, MBA from the George Weiss University. Prior to her legal career, Sweet was a high school teacher and educational lecturer. She presented at national and international conferences on topics such as human trafficking, violence against Native women, Indian Child Welfare Act compliance, protection orders, and intergenerational trauma. She provides technical assistance to both state and tribal court judges, attorneys, advocates, and court staff. Victoria also assists with curriculum development, judicial training, and um, as well. Her publications include articles on the human trafficking of Native American women and girls and violence against and exploitation of Native women. So we're really excited to have Victoria present here today. Um, I would like to let you know that we will um, reserve some time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. But if you have a question that you'd like to type into the chat box, we'll go ahead and um, address it as we go. But if you miss that opportunity, please know we will have time at the end of the presentation um, for additional questions. So thank you so much. Um, welcome to the webinar, and we'll go ahead and get started. Victoria? Thank you, Gina. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. Uh, as Gina mentioned, we do have a lot of people who are very interested in talking about trauma. And I think trauma is important uh, for a, a lot of reasons. In all communities, when we discuss the justice system, we know that people who are coming into the justice system are dealing with stresses and traumas and other things that really impact them. So at the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, we began taking a look at court systems and talking about how do we make them stronger and better and more of a place of healing. And I know when I say a court system can be a place of healing, that seems antithetical to a lot of people when you think about court systems. But that's because we have always done it a certain way. And perhaps now is a good time with all of the information that has come out about trauma in the, in the communities. Now is a good time for us to start taking a look at the way that we've been interacting in our justice system and thinking, what can we do to do better? And so what I would like to, to cover today, and I think, I can't get this way to work. Uh, sorry, I was playing around with the computer on my end. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about, first of all, what do we mean when we say trauma-informed? So trauma-informed is a term of art, and the, the term of art has a specific meaning. So I'm going to start us off by talking a little bit about the terminology of trauma-informed and what it means, and then we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about why this is a really important topic for tribes in particular. And I don't want to spend all of our time being depressed and talking about the trauma that we know exists in our communities, but I still think it's important for us to acknowledge it and say, yes, we know that we have unique challenges as tribal communities that we're facing. Then we're going to talk a little bit about how trauma presents itself in courts. Uh, I spend most of my time working with judges and other system stakeholders in courts, but if you hear something that doesn't 
then you think, well, you know, I'm not working in a court system, maybe I'm a social worker or I'm a counselor, I'm working in a different setting. I want you to spend some time thinking about some of the principles that we're talking about. How do those apply in other settings as well? Because some of these things that I'm talking about, you could look at a school, you could look at a medical center, you could look at a counselor's office, you can look at all sorts of places and these same principles will transfer. So again, when I'm speaking court systems, don't limit yourself to only looking at how we're dealing with trauma in court systems. Look at how we deal with trauma in our entire systems and in any place where a person might come in contact with the justice system or with other systems. Uh, and then finally, we're gonna spend some time talking about some practical ideas for how you promote healing and how you promote resilience through our systems. And this is where I really feel like we as tribal communities have a leg up in some ways over the, the state systems. We have culture, we have traditions, we have things that can give us additional suggestions and ideas and thoughts about how to deal with trauma from a perspective that is uniquely ours. And a lot of other places, they wish that they had that. They wish that they had that kind of an opportunity. So while we might spend some time talking about the traumas that our communities face, we also get the, the ability to talk about the beautiful things that our cultures bring to the conversation. So let's go ahead and get started with the discussion of what we mean by trauma-informed. SAMHSA put together a definition and it, com it has four components to it. So the first component has to do with realization. A trauma-informed system or a trauma-informed individual is someone who realizes the widespread impact of trauma and understands potential paths for recovery. So first of all, we simply need to have the conversation and say trauma exists and it likely exists with the people that we are interacting with through our systems. The second one is about recognition. A trauma-informed individual and a trauma-informed system is one that recognizes signs and symptoms of trauma in clients, families, staff, and others who are involved with the system. So what might trigger trauma? Um, how, how does it show itself? You know, sometimes when we see someone acting a certain way, we don't necessarily recognize that their action is a symptom simply of trauma. Now, when I say that, we're not excusing bad behavior. By saying this might be a trauma reaction doesn't make it okay for someone to act badly, but it helps us have a better understanding of what might be causing the behavior so we know better how to address it. The third component has to do with response. A trauma-informed individual and a trauma-informed system responds by fully integrating the knowledge that you gain about trauma into your policies, your procedures, and your practices. So you have to do more than say, we know there's trauma in our community, we recognize what it looks like, we want to actually be doing something proactive to address it in a positive manner. And then the final component of being trauma-informed is the concept of seeking actively to resist re-traumatization. And this is when we get to that idea that a court system or a prison or an education system or any system can actually be a place of healing. Even if we've always looked at it as a place of punitive problems or a place where negative things happen, if we seek to actively avoid re-traumatizing someone who has already been traumatized in the first place, we can create places of healing for our communities and our community members. And if I'm going through this fast and, you, and someone wants to throw up in a point and say, slow down, tell me to, because I'm used to, I'm more of an in-person presenter. <laughs> I'm used to being able to interact with my audience a little better. Um, but hopefully you all are catching and, and uh, this is making sense to you. So we also need to be paying attention to things like potentially traumatic experiences. We know that if someone experiences abuse or neglect, especially in their childhood or youth, that is going to be a potentially traumatic experience. Any type of accident can have a traumatic impact on someone. Interpersonal violence and domestic violence, of course, we don't often think about this, but a medical procedure can create a traumatic experience for someone. 
uh, natural disasters. I remember as a child spending time in our basement when we knew there was going to be a tornado in the area, or we thought there could be a tornado in the area. We lived out in a rural community, and there was not some tornado siren that could go off. So when the weatherman said there was a watch in place, my mom would move us down into the basement at night. And I can remember as a child the, the stress of being down in the basement with my blanket and my pillow, seeing my mom pacing and how nervous she was. I still remember the stressful feelings that that brought in, in me. So sometimes we forget to think about the, the, the idea that even a natural disaster can create this sort of traumatic experience for someone. And then we have things like war, terrorism, uh, if there's a shooting in town, if there's been a series of break-ins and things that have caused people to become hypervigilant in the neighborhood or in the community, all of these things are listed as potentially traumatic experiences. When you are exposed to one or more of these PTEs, they have an, there's an increased likelihood of developing psychiatric symptoms and ailments like PTSD and various stress disorders. So we need to start, as we're looking at our communities and as we're looking at the individuals in our communities, particularly those who end up being uh, systems involved, Look for the history of PTEs in their lives. Look for the history of things having occurred that can trigger uh, the, the psychiatric symptoms or ailments that we're talking about. These are the particular people that we need to be paying attention to. One area that has recently come in, uh, in the literature are kids who have parents who are in the armed forces and who are deployed. A lot of these children are home they're not being exposed to particularly traumatic experiences, but they have a parent who is off, who's away for long periods of time, and maybe the parent who's left behind at home is really stressed out, worried about the safety of their spouse, stressed out about trying to do it by themselves. Those children in particular recently have come to the attention of a lot of, of professionals as kids who are starting to develop a lot of stress disorders and learning dis difficulties. And in Native communities, we do have a really high rate of people who serve in the armed forces. So again, something to think about. Do we have a lot of potentially traumatic experiences in the lives of the community members that we're working with? Stress derived from trauma exposure tends to significantly impair emotion regulation and executive functioning at a neurological level. Children who have trauma are at a heightened risk of committing delinquent and or violent acts. So a lot of times what you see is just the tip of the iceberg. You see a behavior. You see a child who's sullen, or you see that suddenly this child who's behaved really well is depressed, or they've stolen something from a store, or they've done something that is completely out of character. All you're seeing, though, is the actual behavior. What we're missing is the rest of the story, the thing that triggered that behavior. Uh, and that's why we have, we have to spend a lot of time, in particular with our children and youth, when they start committing delinquent acts, when they start acting out in certain ways, it's purely a manifestation of something deeper and something more. This is that trauma-informed piece that we need to have. We need to be aware what might be triggering it, what might be underneath the surface of the actions that we're observing. Uh, so really quickly, we're going to throw up a quick poll. I want to talk for just a minute about the ACEs uh, scale, and I want to know, if you wouldn't mind taking a minute to answer, have you taken the ACEs questionnaire, or are you not familiar with it at all? All right, so I'm seeing as the answers are coming in, there's sort of a mix of people who've taken it, haven't taken it, and a number of you that have not heard of ACEs. Okay. Nice. 
So I'm going to recommend, as you guys are, are typing in your answers, first of all, if you have not heard of the ad, adverse childhood experiences, that you you go take a look at it. Go onto the internet and do a little bit of research if you're interested in learning more about trauma. What the ACEs test does, and for those of you who have taken it you, and you're familiar with it, you know, but it gives you this questionnaire and you go through different experiences that you may have had as a child and then it gives you a number and this rating kind of gives you a sense of uh, how likely you are for certain things negative to happen in your life. And there's a lot of scientific research on it. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into it right now, but I definitely recommend that you take a look when you have a minute. But the higher your ACEs score is, the higher your risk is. So what we're finding is that these, these adverse childhood experiences, sort of like the PTE list that I gave you earlier, put people at a greater risk. So for instance, people with higher ACEs scores are twice as likely to smoke. They are seven times more likely to be alcoholics. Six times more likely to have had sex before the age of 15. Twice as likely to have been diagnosed with cancer. 10 times more likely to have injected with street drugs. And I see the comment and I completely agree. We do need to create one for natives because in addition to all the factors that we're talking about, we also have additional things that we're gonna talk about in a minute that our communities have had to deal with and certain implicit biases and other problems within the system that impact our scores and impact the potential negative effects of these types of stressors on our communities. I'd love to see someone create something like that um, for natives. What the ACEs thing does though is it gives us a, a, a sense. Uh, what is it that we have to overcome in our lives? What things have we been exposed to? And not only can this give us a sense of certain behaviors that are deemed to be risky or harmful, but it even these stresses and these traumas can even lead to early death because of the things that we face and some of the things that we've experienced in our lives. So this ACEs test is, is a good starting place. It's a good little baseline for us as we're trying to determine for ourselves a little bit more about um, what our community members are dealing with, what we personally might be dealing with, and how that impacts our, our risk factors for developing PTSD or stress disorders or even actual medical and physical uh, problems like cancers and other things that can lead to early death. Oh, and, and I really wanted to point this one out because we know what an issue that we have in Native communities with, with suicide. Someone with a really higher, a high ACE score is 12 times as likely to have attempted suicide. Adverse childhood experiences demonstrably create problems for human beings, for people of all communities. And in, in uh, Native America, we have a lot that, we need, that we're trying to overcome. So let's talk for just a minute, and I mentioned I'm just going to go briefly over what this looks like in our community and give a little bit of data in case you haven't seen it. But we have the definition of historical trauma that idea that there is a massive cumulative group trauma across generations. And while we have 567 federally recognized tribes and we have other tribes that are not federally recognized that exist within our country and we have our own unique histories of things that occurred, we also have some shared experiences across the nation with um, the removal policies, the policies of the federal government. And those policies have harmed and caused a great deal of community stress. So on top of issues that we might be dealing with individually within our communities, we also have this shared history of boarding schools and removals and, and adoption acts and other things which have brought trauma and stress into our communities. Uh, this intergenerational trauma has led to a lot of people looking from the outside at our communities and saying, well, what is going on with tribes? not understanding that when you deal with a cumulative trauma, it creates a stress on the community as a whole. I've done several presentations in 
state settings where I said culture is not the same as trauma and tried to help state actors understand that when they see someone coming through their court system and that's the only time that they've dealt with a Native person, they might conflate trauma with culture and start saying this is how Natives are. So we need to start separating out our intrinsic cultures from symptoms of trauma. This is another reason why it's good to start learning this terminology and to be able to have these conversations with professionals outside of our communities to help them separate it out in their minds. And we know there's a lot of data out there that talks that can demonstrate the impact of these types of trauma and how it's impacted our communities. Right now, American Indian and Alaska Native children experience child abuse and neglect at higher rates than any other group of children in our country. We know that tribal youth are two and a half times more likely to experience trauma from exposure to violence than their non-tribal peers. Tribal children and youth experience PTSD at the same rate as veterans returning from places like Iraq and Afghanistan, which is triple the rates of the general population. We also know from a, a study that came out from the CDC that American Indian and Alaska Native men are more than twice as likely to commit suicide as other gender or racial groups. And from a study that was done through the Indian Health Services in 2014, we found that Native youth ages 15 to 24 that were in the IHS service areas, their suicide death rate was four times higher than national average. Our communities clearly are dealing with trauma. Our communities are clearly having these issues that we have to address. And like I said, I don't want to spend all of our time focusing on it. I just think it's important that we acknowledge it as we're having this conversation. Um, and I think that's why it's so important for us to be having, to be, to be taking a look at all of our systems within our communities and asking ourselves, how can we more effectively address the trauma that our community members are facing? So now, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how trauma shows itself in court. And I'm going to ask again for a little participation here. On a scale of one to five, with five being the highest, would you tap into the chat, how traumatic do you think it is to go to court? On a scale of one to five. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of fives coming out. <laughs> I'm going to tell you all, I'm an attorney. And I find it, even as, if I'm going into the system as an attorney, as a professional, I find it pretty stressful. Uh, yeah, I think overall we are all agreeing that, I mean, for some people it's not, I'm seeing a few twos and threes, but most of the people are putting it at a four or five. It's off the charts. <laughs> I'm laughing not because it's funny. I'm laughing because I'm like, yes, that is exactly why when I, when I look at someone and I say, a court could be a place of healing, I'll get looks back like, are you absolutely out of your mind? How can, this is, it's one of the most traumatic and stressful experiences, and it is. And I think we should just acknowledge that, that fact. But I think there are things that we can do to try to reduce the trauma. There are things that we can do to try to address it, and sometimes the things that are going to trigger a traumatic experience or a traumatic reaction in court can be reduced if we are made aware of what those things are. Yes, yes, the idea of having no control of the outcome, and we're gonna to get to that when we start talking about how we can address and perhaps create something that's healing, uh, because you're exactly right. Having no sense of control is going to be one of the quickest ways to trigger someone, especially if that person has an, a history and has had experiences with trauma in their own life. So 
So when we're talking about the court system, and I'm still looking at your comments, so feel free to keep typing them in because it's really interesting for me to see your perspective. I really appreciate it. But you have a person who's walking into an environment, and this person's going to bring with them into the environment whatever baggage that they're carrying with them. And then whatever happens within that environment is in its own way going to affect that person. So we have this sort of uh, interactive thing, and a lot of things that are happening are not happening on a conscious level. They are happening down below, uh, underneath, in almost more of a, a subconscious area. So what we see happen a lot in court is a person who has experienced some sort of trauma or they're feeling traumatized because, like in your comments, they aren't feeling supported, they're not feeling some kind of uh, community or help, they're scared to death, they're intimidated, they're worried about what they're about to face, and then something will trigger them. And what it's going to look like is going to be different in each case. For some people, and this is the obvious one, you'll see someone who will just start to get scared. They'll shake, they'll cry, they'll start putting their arms around themselves in sort of a protective manner. Sometimes, it's the person who shuts down completely. They refuse to talk. They refuse to make eye contact. They're in the court. You're trying to ask them questions. Maybe you are their advocate that's there with them. You're the social worker. You're the attorney. You're trying to support them, and they will not even respond to you. And it's frustrating. And then sometimes we see the people who have the complete meltdown. And it kind of looks like this. They yell, they get violent, they get aggressive, they start swearing at the judge, they do whatever it is. Usually, they're not doing this because they want to be difficult or because they are choosing to have a big meltdown in the middle of court. There's something that happens in the process of being there that triggers an emotional reaction. And it shows itself in all of these different ways. Now, if we aren't aware of trauma and we haven't been trained on how to deal with trauma or how to recognize it when it occurs, then the systemic response in the past has been this person is in contempt, we're going to have to shackle them, we're going to have to remove them, we're going to be tougher on them, we're going to make them have to pay for their behaviors. And once again, by, by recognizing trauma doesn't mean that we're excusing the bad behavior and saying that it's okay. But what it is is we're saying we recognize where this behavior is coming from. What can we do to minimize the chance of having this big, huge explosion happen? What can we do to lessen these traumatic intera reactive interactions? And I absolutely agree. This is why we systemically we need to be talking about how we provide <clears throat> more advocates and more support people so who can recognize when the person is starting to be triggered and starting to melt down. At the National Council, we worked with a group of social psychologists and legal professionals and others who advocates and others to talk about how can we bring tools to people to help us understand how we make our court systems in particular, but our systems as a whole, to be less traumatic and more trauma-informed and trauma-responsive for the people who are involved in our systems. Uh, so we started with a public health perspective. At the foundation of what the work that we do on trauma, we say straight out that all institutions need to play a central role in preventing these traumatic experiences and helping maintain collective health and well-being across our systems. Courts absolutely need to be responsible for being aware of and addressing potential trauma because they are one important component of our society. And courts are in a position where they're very they're very powerful. And they can play a role in either creating additional harm or creating help for the people who end up being system involved. We also have this at the foundation, this idea that we recognize hurt people hurt people. Instead of looking at people and saying, well, this person is sick, or they're well, or they're the offender or the victim, we just come from the, the mindset that probably everyone who's going to come into court 
has experienced trauma and adversity in some way. Whether someone did something to them and they were traumatized by it, or whether they have a history of, of adverse childhood experiences and of these potentially traumatic events that impacted them, which has caused them to start acting out in a negative manner, we're just going to assume that everyone in systems involved has been impacted in some way by trauma. And then we're going to create an environment with practices and policies and people that are designed to work effectively and work well with people who've been traumatized. If there's someone who comes into the courtroom who hasn't experienced trauma, it's not going to harm them to put in some type of universal precautions across the board, but it's certainly going to help the ones that have. Yes, things like safety planning. I, I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm loving, I'm loving the comments that you all are making because it, these are exactly along the lines of some of the practical ideas we're going to go through. But sometimes when I go to this, to the people who work in the system, they get a little defensive when I say, you know, we are, we're going to put in these precautions and assume that everyone has been traumatized, and they think that we're excusing the behavior, or they still see the justice system as a place of punitive efforts, as a place where someone is being punished for bad behavior. We're really working when we do this trauma-informed work to change that mindset, to go back to a way where justice was about coming to a place of healing, where justice was coming to a place where, yes, there's accountability, but there's also an awareness of where our community is. And particularly for tribal communities, we have to live with each other after the court proceedings are done. We're neighbors, we're cousins, we're members of a community. We want to do things differently so that we can have a greater level of healing and a greater level of strength within our own communities. So we defined, uh, well, it was our social psychologists who really worked on this with other professionals, what are the conditions that promote healing and resilience in children and families? And we define three core healing conditions, and then we use those three core healing conditions to help us assess our systems at a level that can be more trauma-informed. So the first core condition of healing is safety. And this is, this is actually a picture of my daughter. She's 23 now. She'd probably die if she knew I was using this. Uh, and you can tell that car seat's really old and outdated. But for me, when I would think about safety with my little ones when they were little, what could I do? What is the, the best thing I could do to provide the most safety possible? Well, one of the things when I was getting in the car with them, I'd get a good car seat. And I'd, I'd make sure it was installed properly, and I would do everything within my power. And there would be some things that would be outside of my power, but everything within my power to provide as much safety for them as I could. Safety is fundamentally necessary to allow people to engage in the justice system. If they do not feel safe in our system, they will not engage. They will shut down. They will not participate. This is exactly why we have um, victims who will not show up. You know, it's their day in court. We expect they're going to come in. There's the person that's harmed them. They're going to have the chance to see justice done, and they don't show up. They don't feel safe in our systems. Um, if people feel psychologically or physically threatened, they cannot heal, and they will have difficulties benefiting from any services that we try to provide. They become hypervigilant. They start perceiving threats even where they don't exist. So yes, and, and so we have to think, all right, and, and I think this point that's being made is really valid here, which is that if you're too friendly with the offender, you can give someone the idea of collusion. So how do we create, create an environment of safety where we're respecting all people involved in the system while at the same time making sure that we're saying people are being held accountable for their actions? Yeah, this dialogue is great. <laughs> so safety is the first thing that we're going to look at. The second core condition of healing is agency. So someone mentioned earlier, court can be traumatic because you get no choice. You just you show up in court and then everything is dictated to you. What can we do to provide some sort of self-determination or choice within our systems? 
PTSD, in some of its definitions, talks about it arises out of choice being stolen from someone. If you want to successfully help someone heal, you've got to give them a sense of choice back. Uh, we talk a lot about people who are very systems involved being learned helplessness or shame. So what can we do within our systems to provide a little bit of, of self-determination or choice? And, and I'm, I'm going to go into each of these and, and how we, you know, some practical suggestions for how we do it. But if you're thinking about your own tribes, your own systems that you work in, start, start assessing your own practices and your own communities um, using these core conditions of healing as a, a, a place to start. And then the third condition of healing that we look at is connectedness. Uh, when we talk about resiliency, the formal defi definition of resiliency is the capacity to thrive in the face of adversity. One of the biggest factors, and especially when we're talking with children and youth, but really for anyone, when you're trying to build resiliency is, are these pro-social connections. The idea that there's someone that they are connected to, someone positive that promotes important social connections for them and helps them heal and provides the support necessary to help them heal. Uh, one of the keys, though, of course, is that it needs to be a person of character. So at the National Council, what we've done is we've taken those three conditions of healing, safety, agency, and connectedness, and then we apply them in three different places within a system. We first look at your, your actual environment, your buildings, your rooms, the environment within which people are, are going. The second thing we look at is the concept of safety, agency, and connectedness with the people who are involved in the system, the actual workers in the system. And then we assess our practices and our policies that way. And we've used this assessment structure in courts, both state and tribal courts around the country, and usually it, it's a few neutral parties coming in and sort of assessing these three different things from the perspective of safety, agency, and connectedness. But as I'm going through this, um, it, it can be done by people who are in the system too. We just have to be able to take a step back and take a look at things that we've gotten used to and ask some real questions to evaluate whether the systems, the people, and the environment are actually promoting healing or if we're doing things just because that's the way it's always been done. So let me, let me give you some examples and show you what I'm talking about. We'll go through some practical ideas right now. Um, I also want to give you this foundational definition. Uh, let's see here. A foundational definition of what I mean when I say trauma responsive, because just like trauma informed had a definition, so does trauma responsive. At our council, we, we define trauma responsive as meaning a court or a system in which these environments, practices, policies, and persons limit unnecessary stress and promote healings in, in those who've been trauma and exposed. This includes both the people who are going through and using the system and the people who are working in the system. And I think this is one thing that does not get talked about enough. Uh, a lot of times we are focusing on our court systems and we're saying, all right, so the person who's coming in has been traumatized or the person who's coming through has had a bad experience. But what about the people working in the system? How can those of us who serve in systems promote trauma responsive practices, promote uh, these healing environments if we are burned out and have been traumatized ourselves by things. We, uh, we need to be thinking about the well-being of our community who's also working in the system. How many people look at our social workers, look at our attorneys, our judges, people working in the systems, our advocates, and think, oh, we also need to be doing a lot of self-care. I know that this is a common, it's a, an idea that's come up recently. We need to be doing this a lot more, though. Uh, people that we don't think about are being traumatized by working in our systems. In one of the places where we did a, a trauma responsive assessment, we found that the person who was severely impacted by things was actually the custodian who was working in the building. 
this person was sweeping floors and walking by people and they were hearing um, people in the hallway. They were hearing people, they were seeing the trauma in people's faces. They were hearing the stress that people were experiencing and they were actually taking some of those stresses on secondhand. Uh, another group of people that we don't often think about is if in your court has any type of court reporter or someone who's typing out transcripts of things that are being said in, in the court system, they're hearing word for word every detail of the testimony of abuse cases, of domestic violence cases, of assault cases. Many of those people don't actually have any type of training to deal with it. This is their job. They thought their whole job was simply to type up the things that were being said, and in fact, it's negatively impacting them. Our entire system, including the people working within it, are the ones that we need to be taking a look at. So again, we go in and we take a look at, these tra at trauma in the court. We're going to look at your environment. You're going to look at your practices and policies, and you're going to look for general stress, navigability, and the interaction of people with one another. And I've sort of touched on this already, but nationally, tribal and non-tribal, there is burnout and there is turnover in our, in our court systems. We don't have any kind of inoculation to protect us from secondary stress. There are always environmental stressors. I have never been in a building that does not have some type of environmental stressors. Our systems can be very hard to navigate and overwhelming and scary for people. And it is tricky to apply knowledge about trauma. And I'm not going to pretend that any of the stuff I'm saying, some of the suggestions that we're going to go through are things that are pretty easy to fix, but some of them are not. Some of them require community buy-in. Some of them require us to step back and think, what, what are we doing and why are we doing it this way? Sorry, if I, if I pause periodically, it's because I am reading some of your comments because I love hearing from people who are in the field right now thinking about how we apply these principles. And I really appreciate some of these perspectives that I'm seeing and hopefully I'll get to all of them. But if I don't and any of you want to bring them up at the end, I, I really hope that you will. I, I see this, um, this webinar as an opportunity to engage the community in a conversation about how these things impact Indian country. Uh, a lot of, some of these principles are things that we did in state courts, and I recognize that we need to alter and shift them for tribal courts. But again, I go back to what I started with. I think as tribes, we have something that the states don't have, which is our history and our culture and our traditions that we can find ways to bring in. And no one outside of your community is the one who's um, is, is an expert on how to do that in your community. You are. And that comment about feeling traumatized thinking back on the events that have happened, absolutely. So many people, this is why we burn out some of our best advocates and our best workers. It's why right now, I'm going to say this straight out, I'm working on policy levels from a national perspective instead of practicing in court right now because I experienced things in court in child abuse and neglect cases that just ripped my heart out, which caused me to cry for days. Nobody explained to me, you know, how do I deal with the things I was seeing. They just taught me how to do my job. I'm really glad that we're, that we're talking about that. So our culture. I, I made this point already, but I want to make it again. This is a picture that represents my culture. Each one of us have our own. We as, as communities are the experts on what our culture looks like and how we can weave it in to help us deal with trauma. So as an Anishinaabe woman, we have seven grandfather teachings. And there are a number of Ojibwe and Odawa and Potawatomi courts around the country that I've been able to observe and go and visit. Several of them have taken a core teaching which we have, which is our seven grandfather teachings. In one court that I can think of in particular, the judge keeps the seven grandfather teachings on the wall. And as people are coming in and as he's having to make decisions, he'll stop and he'll look at them and he will refer to these seven grandfather's teachings and say, all right, um, 
love is a core teaching. How do we bring love into this into this case? Or where does bravery fit in? Or humility or honesty. And he makes a point as the judge and he keeps it on his wall so that he doesn't forget it. This is important. This is the core. This is who we are as a people. And this is what separates us from other communities. And I need to make sure that these core grandfather teachings are at the heart of everything that I do. Some of these communities have also made a point of making sure that all of these um, all of these grandfather teachings are part of their tribal codes that they are creating, that they are weaving it in in all of their policies and practices, that before they have really tough community conversations, they start with a reminder of the core of who they are as a people and then refer back to them as they're making decisions. How in line is it with wisdom and respect and truth? This is a picture of the Clinkett Haida Court up in Juneau, Alaska. When you walk into that court, you see the culture. You see the values. Sometimes it doesn't have to be a list of words on a wall. Sometimes it's a picture of the raven and the eagle. Sometimes it's the colors that are put in the courtroom. What are we doing to make sure that our very environment embodies the values that we want to make sure are at the heart of the things that we do in our courts. So in our environment, how do we promote safety? Can we create an environment that limits arousal and reduces the stress on the people who enter it? This one has been brought up in the chat a few times, but when you're looking at your court settings, number one, if you have someone who has been a victim of something, particularly something that's violent, do we have a place for them where they can sit that keeps them safe from the perpetrator? I know that, that in many of our tribes, we are limited in funding. We're limited in the size of the buildings that we have, but what could be done if we have those kinds of limitations to create an environment of safety? What can we do to protect a community member who has gone through something that's particularly scary and dangerous um, to make sure that they are not, that they're not feeling like their perpetrator is continuing to cause them to feel unsafe in the court setting? Another point that we need to look at when we're examining our environments and, and considering safety, do they feel safe coming into the court? And in the court areas, are there waiting areas or are there other things that are done to make them feel safe? There are some very small tribal courts that have now started putting in metal detectors because they're trying, because they had experiences where someone was in court and someone smuggled something in that was dangerous. Uh, that's not necessarily the answer for every tribal court, but what are we doing to help them feel safe? Have we implemented things where, for instance, someone who was a victim of something violent is able to leave and be escorted out of the building before the person, the alleged perpetrator, is allowed to leave? Um, do we have separate entrances? Do we have separate places to sit? All of these types of things we need to take a look at that within the environment. And yes, sometimes we can't always bring in, if we have people that are working for us that are not tribal members, we have to figure out what we can do. Is there something that we can do within the environment that um, brings in the particular tribal culture and values to the court system? But right now, I'm just looking specifically at the question of safety. Can you take a look at the environment in which they're, the people are coming? Does it promote safety for them or does it make them feel even more unsafe as they come into the court? Yes, security in the parking area, security around the building. Sometimes we don't think about where something dangerous or something harmful could happen. Take a look at the environment and not just your court. If you're ordering substance abuse treatment or counseling or other things, are they safe going to those places as well? 
consider the entire system and what we are doing to promote environmental safety for people. Uh, another question is simply the ability to navigate a system. For a lot of people, if you've gone to some of the court, the state courts, they are ridiculous. You cannot figure out which courtroom down which hallway and how you get through the process and what floor you need to be on, you know, when, when we're looking at the bigger systems. Um, but, and, and I've been to tribal courts that have some pretty large court buildings as well. But even like, how do you get to the court? Is it easy to navigate your way there? Is it easy to navigate to the different, uh, a place to go get an assessment, a place to go get counseling? How hard is it to find our way there? Because sometimes it feels kind of like this. And if you are already a stressed out person, if you're already traumatized, simply feeling like you might be late for the hearing or that you might be late for your appointment is enough to trigger someone into one of those huge traumatic behavior explosions. So again, look at your own community, look at your own needs. How navigable is your system? How easy is it going to be for someone to find their way or to get there? Is there, um, is there a, a public transportation system within their reservation that helps them get there? Is there some other thing that can be used to make it easier for people who are stressed out and worried to make it without having some kind of negative reaction. Another question that we often ask, do the people have a place to meet with their attorney or advocate where everyone doesn't hear them? Again, this can be a really hard thing if you're a tribe with a limited budget and you don't have a lot of places, but is there a way to create that? Is there a way to create some sort of privacy so they don't feel like they're standing in the middle of a hallway with everyone watching them and overhearing the things that they're talking about? It doesn't feel safe. It feels stressful if you don't have a place where you can actually speak with someone, the person who's supposed to be representing your needs. Another thing that we talk, and we talk about this mostly with judges, do they have to wait for a really long time for their hearing? Do they say, all right, everyone, everyone has to be here at 8 a.m. and you have to sit and wait, and then the hearing doesn't even happen until 11. They're hungry, they're tired, they're missing work, they're exhausted, they're in this environment that does, is not conducive to positivity. So do we have a way of improving that within our system? And I'm giving you some real blanket ideas that aren't going to apply in every single system, but if it, if it applies in yours, write down some ideas. What can we do to make the process less stressful for the people who, who go through it? Also, simple things like noise, light, and temperatures impact people. I'm often this person. I get cold. I get cold all the time, and when I get cold, I get grumpy. If I get overly hot, I might get grumpy. Um, do we have control over even just the temperature in the environment? Flickering lights. Have you ever thought about the fact that a flickering light could be a trauma trigger for someone? It's annoying for someone else who doesn't have maybe PTSD or some type of hypervigilance issue, but for the person who does, and that light just keeps flickering on and off, that by itself could be something that triggers a traumatic reaction. We had a, a, someone that we were interviewing in one of the courts where we did a trauma assessment, and she was someone who had gone through the system, and she talked about getting, starting to have panic attacks while she was sitting waiting for her hearing, and it took her a long time to realize what was triggering the panic attack. It was the sound of a squeaky hinge that was opening and closing on one of the doors. The reason that that triggered a panic, panic attack for this woman is that when she was young, she had been sexually abused by her stepfather. And the last noise that she would hear before he would enter her room was the squeaky hinge of her door. You don't know what is going to trigger someone. And the people working in the court didn't even hear the, the squeaking of the hinge anymore because they had been working there for so long that they got used to it. But that triggered a panic attack in this woman. It made it so that she was struggling to be able to maintain her composure to sit through her hearing. 
something as simple as changing a light bulb, greasing a hinge, a, getting a better air conditioner, whatever it is, something like that could be the difference between having people triggering and reacting badly in our courtroom versus people who aren't. We need to remember that when someone is hypervigilant and someone is on their guard because of a traumatic history, the, the thing that has become normal to us is not normal to them. So we need to even look at the simple things in our environment and ask ourselves, how could this impact someone who has PTSD or some type of stress disorder? How about the art that's on the walls? These are some pictures from an actual courtroom. I won't say where. And when we started showing these to people, they were freaking out. The energy and the feeling of the, the artwork was sort of chaotic. And actually seeing those art pictures caused people to start feeling uncomfortable, to feel stressed. It negatively impacted them. I think a lot of us who are, who are Native, we talk a lot about the things in our environment and the energy of things and how it can impact us. Have you ever stepped back and looked at the art that's on the walls of the waiting rooms and courts and in counselors' offices and where they meet with their advocates and how that could potentially impact someone who's gone through traumatic experiences? Here's a different picture, completely different feel to it. This one I, uh, is hanging on the wall in Little Traverse Tribe. And it's another cultural representation of values but there's nothing frantic or crazy about it. It's just a comfortable picture. Um, so taking a look and being able to compare and contrast how it's done, that makes a huge difference. Here's a picture from a state court in Maryland. They decided they wanted to find a way to be more trauma-informed in their response to children who were coming into court with their families. And they ended up creating this. Now, not everyone has the budget to create something like this, but what a different feel. Look at how different it is compared to another courtroom. And this was a state court. They have restrictions on how they can do things that sometimes we as tribes do not have. And yet they were able to get the, the system buy-in to be able to create this type of environment for their court. So much more trauma-informed, especially for these children. Uh, there are some tribal courts I know of. They couldn't do a complete redecoration and reforming of their court, but they've done similar things, like they, they'll buy a bunch of um, little stuffed animals, and if the child's in court, they can go behind and, and pick out a stuffed animal from the judge and keep it with them and hold it with them while they're going through the process of sitting and being in court. Um, there are so many... Uh, things that can be done to try to make the environment a less stressful environment if we're just creative about it. There's another state court I know where they hired an artist and they put cartoon paintings on the wall and they've created places with, where um, it's like a whiteboard wall where people can color and draw on. Just things that make it a little less intimidating and scary. And I know I'm focusing right now on children because I think with children it's a more dramatic example. But again, we can step back and take a look at all the people who are going to be coming through our systems and ask ourselves, what is the environment doing to cause them to feel or not feel safe? This is a picture from Mississippi Choctaw's peacemaking courtroom. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on peacemaking. I'm not an expert on it. There are others who are and have done webinars on it. But look at the difference in the feel of that room, the circle, the chairs, the, the facing each other. They are putting they're creating a different environment by simply the way that they set up their entire courtroom. It says we're doing things differently here. And I think that's a very important point that we need to think about. That was all environment. <laughs> and how we look at our environment and say what is going on within our environment that could be triggering trauma in the people who come through our court system. Another thing is what about the people who are working in our systems and the people who are going through it? First of all, have we put, created any kind of initiatives to make sure that all the people working in our court systems have a shared understanding and definition of trauma? That ACEs study that I gave you is a good place to start. 
I do have examples, and I'll, I'll make sure that you all have my email address if you'd like to see examples, but there are tribes right now that have started initiatives to create trauma-informed systems across the board. And everyone working in all different departments within the tribe are getting uh, tra training on trauma together, talking about what trauma looks like, talking about how trauma has impacted their individual community so that you have some continuity between systems. If your court personnel are trained on trauma, but your police are not, or your educators are, are, are uh, getting some kind of trauma training, but you know some other part of the community is not, you don't have a consistent message. And you're gonna find people being, um, being traumatized in one part of the system and not in another, and then they still don't develop a trust because they just never know from person to person how they're gonna be treated. I already spent a little bit of time talking about secondary traumatic stress, really prioritizing the well-being of those of us who work in the system. Uh, we, we just, I can't stress it enough, whether I'm talking state or tribal, we don't do it enough. We don't take care of ourselves enough. I am a mom and I'm a grandma. And so for me, I've, I've always had this thing that I've got to take care of the kids, I've got to take care of my grandbaby, I need to make sure everyone else is taken care of. And sometimes I forget to prioritize myself, and that has moved into my professional life as an attorney. We need to be talking about this more. I can't stress it enough. Uh, another way that you become trauma-informed with the people is you get the opinions of the community members. And we're open to some ugly criticism sometimes that's not easy to hear, but how trauma-responsive, how trauma-informed are we as a community? How are we doing in our court system? How are we doing in all these other systems within the community to address the concerns about trauma? And, and this one, I, I hit it really hard in state settings, but I think it's something we should step back and ask ourselves in our, in our tribal settings as well. What kind of diversity do we have among our court professionals? I know that I tend to, I've done a lot of work in child welfare and domestic violence field, and there tend to be a lot of women that I work with. So a lot of times I'll ask, well, why we, are, we, are we doing enough to reach out to get more men? Uh, if we are hiring a lot of people who are not tribal members, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but what are we doing to make sure that there are tribal members interspersed in that as well? That the community background, the community values are being represented in our system and that our systems are a representation of the community at large. We also need to take a, a look at some of our policies. Do we have a policy where we presumptively shackle juveniles in our tribal courts? If we do, we need to take a step back and ask ourselves why. If you have a child, a, a teenager in particular, and they have gone through some really, maybe they, they were in a really abusive home as a child, they've gone through things, now they're a juvenile, they've been acting out, and they're truant. And they get picked up for truancy, so they're gonna come in on a status offense in our court. Do we just, as a matter of practice, shackle them? What does that do when we look at safety for our juvenile? What does that do when we talk about building trust? When we talk about choice? Are we creating a system where, where we just automatically treat them as a criminal and, and shame them because they ended up in court? Or are we going to try to do something different? Now clearly, if there's a safety concern, if someone is potentially violent, we don't want to expose the people working around them to violence. But if we don't, is that really the best practice to have learned from the states and brought into our, in our tribal court system? And yeah, the National Council has a very strong policy statement that presumptive shackling needs to end, particularly in the cases of juveniles. But I have visited many tribal courts that have taken on this practice from the states because that's just how it's been done. We need to step back and we need to look at all of our policies and ask ourselves, why are we doing this? And does it promote safety? Does it promote agency? Does it promote social connectedness, and if it doesn't, why do we have it? Another thing that we talk about, and we talk about it a lot in the states, and I think in tribes we should talk about it too, which, which is do we have children in court? I know that there are times 
when it's not appropriate for a child to be in court, where it would be extremely stressful on them. And we don't want to be bringing them in so often that they're missing school and other things. But if we're talking about agency, some of the, the feedback that we've gotten from former foster children and children who've been a system involved is we wanted to know more about what was happening. We wanted to know more about why this why this decision was being made or feel like we could actually say something in our own behalf as we got older. So what is our policy internally on having children in court and why? When is it appropriate? When is it not appropriate? And by the way, people who've done it a certain way for a long time will push back. But we need to we need to remind us that, that not every policy, not every practice that has been implemented in the past was trauma-informed. And in order to create a, a more healing environment, we need to review our policies again from that lens. Uh, and then again, how do we handle domestic violence cases when we're trying to ensure the safety of victims, when there's a parent that's a victim, when there's children involved? Uh, this is not the webinar for it, but we need to have more conversations where we bring child welfare advocates and domestic violence advocates together and say we have both of these things and we have competing concerns sometimes. Our, our, we each want healing. We each want everyone to be able to come through this hole and well. But sometimes a child welfare person says, I've looked at the ACEs study and these children are being exposed to trauma and I want them out of the home. And the domestic violence advocate is going to come in and say, yes, but you're going to be re-traumatizing someone who's been traumatized. You're punishing them for being a victim of someone else. How do we bring those things together and work together more effectively so that we are working on healing all of us? Um, and again, I'm not going to go too much into the answers for that right now. I don't, quite frankly, I don't have them. But I think that it's an important topic that we need to be spending more time on when we're talking about trauma-informed communities. I think I did something wrong here. Uh, and then I see, I've seen a few of you talk about screenings. Absolutely, we need to have a trauma screening. And we need to figure out as an entire system when the screening is done, who does it, what screening tools are being used. Can we come to a, a, an, a, um, an agreement on how we're going to handle it within our communities? I've actually been in communities where there was a battle of wills about how the trauma screenings were going to be done. And one person said they thought they should be the ones doing it. Someone else said they should be the ones doing it. They couldn't agree on the tool. And so people were going through all these different types of screenings at different times. And it ended up being very, very traumatic for the people involved uh, because they were caught in the middle of this sort of battle, this power struggle over how it was going to be done. So trauma screenings are an, an essential part of practice. And we need to come up with a, a unified approach to how we're going to do it. We do, and I mentioned this already, but we do en en engage youth in the court processes, particularly as they get older. Um, if we don't want them to feel like they're a victim of the system, we need to start getting more conversations going with them. We need to start encouraging them to have a say, to say, you know, I'm very concerned about this, or I don't feel safe in this setting, uh, and, and get their voice heard in the court system. We also need to be engaging parents in the court processes, and that's easier said than done, I completely know. If we have parents, there are many times where I've worked with parents and they're like, they won't even get back to us. They won't go to their counseling appointments. Some family engagement is a skill in and of itself. But as a policy matter and as part of our practice, how are we engaging them so that they don't just feel like their children have been taken and now they're a victim of the system and they just blame everyone else for what's happened, how can we work on getting them more engaged? Knowing, once again, they're probably coming from a background where there's some kind of trauma that's caused them to get to the point where they're losing their children. What can we do to get them more involved? How do we find a pro-social connection for them, a positive one? Uh, I know that there are many tribes that are starting to bring in parent mentors, a parent that's been through the system, that's helping another parent out, helping them um, navigate what it is. We do the same thing with our domestic violence and intimate partner violence victims, making sure there's an advocate, someone that engages them and helps give them that positive pro-social connection that they need to be more involved 
in their life and not just feel like the system is being done to them. And then uh, promoting healing environments through positive interactions with the court. We train a lot of our judges to get out from behind the bench and go get involved in the community, to go to a school and speak so that the kids can see, oh, the judge is a person, <laughs> not just this like black robed thing that's sitting in the court, sitting waiting to, to pass judgment. What are we doing? to make sure that the court and the court personnel are more actively and positively connected um, with the community, and then promoting pro-social connections for youth and families. And then finally, and these are just some, some random ideas that we can talk more about, but when we're looking at our systems and asking ourselves how trauma-informed are they, uh, number one, because we're a George judge organization, we do reach out to our judges a lot to lead. We find that if a judge calls a meeting, people tend to show up. And sometimes we really struggle otherwise. So we reach out to our judges and say, judges, can you lead out and start a conversation? But if the judge isn't interested and someone else in the community does, then who wants to lead out on having a conversation within our community about trauma and about how we become more trauma-informed within our communities? We need to ask questions about why we are doing things the way we are doing them. Are we doing them just because it makes it easier for us, but there's not really any particular reason for it? And are we doing it just because that's how it's always been done? Really step back and take a serious look at the direction and the practices that we have in place and why. Um, I've already mentioned this one, but ensuring that our staff are trained and on the same page that everyone understands how trauma can impact people, that everyone starts learning about the signs that someone is being triggered by something traumatic, how it can look in different settings. Implementing those universal precautions. Assume everyone you come in contact with has had some type of adversity or trauma which has brought them into the system. Practicing and modeling self-care for ourselves and engaging people of character, and then most importantly as tribes, remembering the peace that makes us unique, considering our culture in the decisions that we make, which means that our system and our precautions and our art and our buildings and everything about the way that we do it is going to be unique to us. There is no one answer for how to have a trauma-informed system. There are principles that we can apply to the things that matter most to us. So really fast, if you want to type this in the chat, uh, what have you seen that helps reduce trauma in your community? Is there something that any of you have observed in your community or even in another that you'd be willing to share? Um, I think a lot of us would be interested. The, the conversation has been really rich in the chat box and people are asking questions and answering each other and I've absolutely loved it. Is there something that's going well? Advocates. I 100% agree. Having advocates in the system participating through the process is key. The pictures on the wall, nice. Oh, nice, the ability to, to come behind. Yeah, you know, even some state courts now are starting to get rid of the process of just having the judge at the front and everyone sitting down below them. Oh, therapy dogs are unbelievable what they're able to do. Um, communal lunches, oh nice, for the staff. ACES training, I love seeing that. Outreaching into the neighborhood. Collaboration to reduce secondhand trauma, oh. I've seen kids art on the walls and it's always beautiful. Agency integration, excellent. So I'm trying to keep up here. You know, I was trying to explain to some, some state people, how natives laugh, we laugh a lot, and uh, that has helped us get through some of the toughest times in our communities and our history. Family drug courts, community events. I hope as you're all looking at these chat boxes that you are celebrating the fact that you already are doing things that are trauma-informed and even trauma-responsive. Sometimes when we talk about these topics, 
we get so down because there, it, there are so many issues we're trying to deal with. We're dealing with drugs and we're dealing with, with these historical traumatic events. And I'm giving you some ideas of ways that you can maybe assess differently or think about something that maybe you've never thought about before, but you already are doing good things and you should be celebrating that. Yes. Oh, nice. There's a lot of places that don't have the ability to have informal hearings in native languages. It's beautiful when you can. Something that would definitely encourage. Huh. Yeah, there's there are I think we I think we need to make sure we keep a copy of this chat because some of the ideas that are coming out from you, that's really the key. I can give you these principles and these ideas that we're doing on a national level, both in the states and in the tribal court settings, but the real key are those of you who are in the trenches doing it and the examples that you can share with each other about what you are doing to try to bring healing to your communities. You're doing it. You just need a little bit of support and sometimes we need someone from the outside to come and speak to tribal council or to a judge or to someone else to remind them that, that what you're doing is good and they need more support in bringing these types of programs into your communities. So this is amazing. You all could have taught this. <laughs> I'm gonna change the slide, but I don't want you all to quit typing. I wanna, I wanna keep seeing these ideas. I think we already mentioned that this webinar is being recorded. And so we will have access to all of these ideas that people are putting out so that if anyone wants to go back and review them, it's going to be there. So now I'm gonna open it up, and, but don't quit giving ideas because I love the ideas that you've, that you've put in there, but I'm gonna open it up to see if there are questions or comments or other things that we want to mention that maybe came to your mind as we were going through the slides or that have come to your mind now. And I also want to make sure that you have my email address. So if you want me to send you additional materials, anything I may have referenced, or just ask follow-up questions, feel free. Uh, email is usually the best way to reach me. Yeah, integrating our systems is absolutely an essential part. Uh, some of the biggest confusions and environmental concerns that we've seen in some of the, the places where we've gone and done assessments have been when the departments weren't talking to each other, where people were off doing different things in different settings. Um, ooh, a place to burn stage in the courtroom, that's a tough one, because a lot of the, the zoning ordinances, but a lot of people are now creating out, outer rooms or other things so that they can burn sage and, and smudge their courtrooms, and I think that's really important. I see a lot of other people are still typing, so I'm, I'm waiting. Yeah. Domestic violence, cultural advisors. How about looking at traditional court courts? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there was a webinar done a, a month or so ago about peacemaking courts and other traditional courts. I think that is an incredibly positive thing that so many people are starting to do. They are very much more about restorative uh, principles. They are very much more about collaborating and talking. You get rid of that adversarial process that we have in the West. And as, as someone who is trained in the Western system but who is also Native, I mean, I am, I'm an enormous fan. I've seen peacemaking and other types of traditional practices and how much they promote healing in communities. Um, they would like a repost of the links provided earlier in the chat. Traditional prayers. I know there are some tribes that are starting to have elders available 
um, for people who want to talk with them before they go into the court setting or who counsel with them after to talk about what it is that they need to do. I've seen an increase in elders councils where the elders actually get involved and talk about sentencing and talk about ways that someone can, can um, be held accountable for what they do, but not in a way where it's just like we're just going to lock you up or we're just going to punish you, but the elders of the community are coming together to help create a, an action plan for them. I feel like I've learned so much from all of you just from the comments that are typed in. I really appreciate your willingness to share what your communities are doing. I think the key toward having trauma-informed courts is to learn these principles and then to learn from each other and see what other people are doing. And let yourself be educated by your community, absolutely. Nice. I think there's been an increase in peacemaking among tribes around the country and there's a lot of interest in it. Um, we do have contact information for people who train on peacemaking, so if anyone would like that, please feel free to reach out. Thank you, Alicia, for reposting those links. And thanks to all of you for being here. I'm going to, there's still some people typing things. I want to encourage that, but I also want to give Gina a few minutes here toward the end to go ahead and wrap us up. So Gina, I'm going to turn this back to you now. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victoria. This has been an amazing webinar. And um, definitely want to mention, again, we will have the links to share. And so folks in your community who have, were not able to listen in can listen in to the recorded um, webinar. Um, I want to point out a couple things. Um, first, the save the date for the National American Indian Court Judges Association's annual conference, the Tribal Judicial and Court Clerk Conference, is coming up October 11th through the 13th. It's going to be at the Bleda um, Pueblo, the resort and casino. And for more information, you can go to the NIJA website at NIJA.org. Um, also, I wanted to mention that um, NIJA is working very closely with many partners, including NCJ, FCJ, and um, working on providing training and technical assistance to tribes. And for um, a request, if you're interested, um, you can go to the NIJA website. There's um, a form to fill out, but um, areas including um, trauma assessment um, services are available. So if your tribe is interested in um, learning more, in having specific training, having um, some, you know, digging, delving deeper into this area, um, we definitely would love to hear from you. And so, again, the request can be made through the website. Also, if you want to just have a conversation beforehand, um, be welcome um, to give us a call or an email. Um, my email is gina at nija.org. And so I think this has been just amazing and just love all of the comments. Um, thank you, Victoria and the National Council staff for providing this platform and everyone who um, came and gave of their time today to listen and participate. So thank you very much. If there's any last questions, we can hear them now or we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Okay, it looks like that's it. So thank you so much. Everyone have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.